Hello. We live in a world where efficiency and productivity are deemed to be the highest of virtues. We always need to do more, to have more, to strive for more. And is that the answer to save the planet? I think it's a resounding no. I think we need to step back, take a pause from working, and I think that we need to reevaluate our connection to ourselves, to others, to work, and to the planet. I believe we need to start playing. What's that? Is that a mammoth? Imagine that I am a caveman and I need to hunt a mammoth with a spear and go after him. And I have all my friends next to me and we're going in a crowd and we're like, we're going to kill this mammoth and get, take all its meat. And I'm just as about to throw the spear, I hear this very, very annoying voice over there that goes like, go to the left, throw your spear now. I look at him and go like, who's that? And I run to it, ignore the voice, we throw the spear, we kill the mammoth, we go towards our village, we ignore the fat man at the back that people were carrying and he was screaming some weird things at me. We go to the village, very happy that we have killed the mammoth and we got a lot of meat for our village. But once we get to the village, there's this huge veil, kind of this big, about this big, in front of the chieftain's house. And all the meat goes behind the house. And he says that we have to keep all the meat overnight because at night, the God's people will come and they have to take 40% of the meat. Okay. In the morning, when I wake up and the God's people have taken almost half of all our meat, I get a secret box. I go behind the veil, I take my box. And everybody in the village gets a box, and I open it, and inside of it, there's a piece of meat, my part of the meat. Wow. I look at all the other people in the village, and I see that the boxes are not quite the same size. Some people have big boxes. The chieftain has like a huge box. Some people have like really tiny boxes. I'm like, hmm, interesting. Is that how things work? Is that how you would like to work in a society? Is that how you think you would feel, how would you think you would feel in a society like that? In a community like that? And is this how you think they hunted for mammoths as villages and people? Well, I don't think so. And the question I'm trying to think about is like, well, how did they do it? It seems to me it was much more natural, much more fluid, without all these weird fat people telling me what to do. I could trust my team and my people around me and we split things quite fairly. But if I was in this imaginary society, or better yet, I'm gonna ask you the question, if you guys were in this imaginary society, would you take it? It's a question. Would that be okay for you? No? Interesting. Because that's exactly what you do now. Right? You say you're not going to take it, but you go to work and you get the salary. But only 10% of companies reveal the amounts, even ranges, right? They don't even reveal the amounts. About 1% or 2% of companies openly share all their uh, job salaries with employees. Most don't reveal anything. And you're like, yeah, that's fine. No problem. That's okay. I like it. It's great. And then you get these people who are like hired managers. You've been working for 20 years and then this guy comes in out of college, he's a manager, knows nothing about the job. Like, go, do this, excellent. You're like, yeah, sounds good, awesome, I love this. I love my job, really, it's great. You look at the CEO, he's making 324 times more money than you, that's actually a real number. That's the average number of money that the CEO makes more of compared to median employee salary. I've been a CEO of m most of my life, so maybe I shouldn't complain that much. But people who were not CEOs, maybe I should. Then we have the owners. 
And I kind of get the owner thing when, you know, a couple hundred years ago when you had to build factories and invest a lot of stuff. But right now, you have an idea, you start coding, 10 years later, you're a billionaire. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. Right? I, don't, I don't know if it's worth it. I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I'm asking the questions. I'm trying to figure out whether that is the best way how we can organize our society. And what makes me very curious, like why did we shift away from this supernatural way of doing things where everybody thought everything is fair? How the hell did we get tricked into going like, yeah, that's fine. It's okay. I love it. And there is some real stuff about it. One is that our society was built around the fireplace, around sitting down, building a fire, talking, and gossiping. And that's when we started to build slightly bigger societies, slightly bigger villages, bigger tribes. And they got bigger and bigger, and the bigger the village, the more strength you have, right? So if you have a big village, and another village comes, if you have a lot of people, you're stronger, you can beat them. At some point, we hit a Dunbar number. And the Dunbar number sounds really weird, right? But the Dunbar number is around 150 people. At around 150 people, natural, sort of speak, um, way of organizing ourselves breaks down. We just can't do it. We can't keep more than 150 people in our brains, so we can't come up with a good structure to go beyond that. But to be safe, we needed to, right? Somebody got to 150, so we have to have a society of 500, 600, 1,000, 10,000. So we're like, okay, we have to do it somehow. So we introduced structure, we introduced chieftains and bosses and all these things, because that was the only way to do it. You have to have strength. And also you have to do big things. It took 400,000 people to get us from here to the moon in the Apollo space program. 400,000 people. Do you think it was efficient? Hell no, right? It's like one of the most least efficient things we could have done. But that was the only way to get to the moon, right? So we had to do a lot of very weird things to get to the moon. But, and that is why we had to create these structures that we actually none of us really like. And what I'm trying to say this is like, we created a society where modern work is basically slavery. Because if you're a slave, like think about it, what do you do? You work and you do something hard that you don't enjoy in order to get food and maybe shelter, and you do get some time off, maybe not that much. Most of us work way too much anyways. 50% of people in the world who work report daily stress. 41% uh, of people consider themselves uh, uh, sad, right? 22% worried and 18% outright angry. The numbers don't add up because it was two separate questions for the math mathematicians in the room. And basically what we've done is we've put ourselves in a situation where most of us are just not happy with our lives. And I kind of don't like that. I don't want to be sitting there in the, in the auditorium being like, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. And then, wait, I am in that situation. Right? I wouldn't want to have that realization that many of you hopefully had today. And that fortunately, or I'd rather say, like, I'm not gonna say that this is a bad thing. Right? We had to do it. Because, as I explained, to do really complex things, we had to organize ourselves in such particular ways. And everything we've done is to build these complex structures. But if you want complex structures with hundreds of thousands or millions of people, if you, people are gonna ask questions, if they are going to be wondering whether it's fair or whether they're gonna be like, well, what do I do about it? Or whether, if they create a lot of new ideas, well, that's gonna destroy the system. It's not gonna work. So we have schools and parents and financial systems and society that is basically making sure you're not too creative. You don't ask too many questions. If, you, if anybody has survived post-Soviet education as I have, you know what I'm talking about. Right? I, I don't know how the hell I still have ideas. Right? I, I did manage to escape to Sweden and Estonia and international schools at, when it was ninth grade. So, you know, there was some safety there. But I remember my Soviet school. Right? It was like, if you, if you have one creative thought, like one more creative thought, you're out of here. It was annoying. 36 people in the class, like non-creative thoughts allowed. But that, that was necessary because there was just no other way, right? There was no other way to do it. Like imagine if 400 years ago, 
you want to create a brand new company. And go like, we're going to be super transparent. We're going to give everybody access to all our financial data. What are you going to do? Right? You have a book, one book, one book, and you have 500 people. Go like, hey, guys, come, take a look at the book. Wait, wait, I need to make a new entry. And then there's like a line of 500 people. Right? It's impossible. It's physically impossible to show this stuff to them. You go, okay, okay, we're going to do, we're gonna do democratic voting, guys. Governance is going to be awesome, excellent. How are you going to do it? Like, how are you going to ask everybody five times a day what you want to do, where to go, where to, how to get data? How are you going to get information from people? Right? There's impossible. If you're an artist and you work in a city and you run out of people to sell to, like if you need to move to another city, that's like a five-year project. Right? So you just couldn't do it any other way. So I'm not blaming what we have created. It got us thus far. And that's a good thing. What I am saying is that it was not possible until now. What I am saying is that now we have the technologies to stop working as slaves, to stop working where we don't like our work, to stop working where everybody hates it, to stop working when everybody is depressed, sad, and doesn't like it. And there's two aspects to that. One is technology and the other is mindset. So let's cover technology first. That's the easy part. We have a lot of technological advances right now. As you see my slides, all of them were created by AI. Right? All images were created by InJourney. Right? Uh, even the opening text that I read to you was created by AI. I asked it last night. Can you write the most inspiring opening paragraph for a keynote on the topic of stop working, it will save humanity. Right? I read it to you in the beginning. Right? I was like, it can even replace creativity. Right? I, I, the rest of the speech is mine, I promise. Uh, I don't think it can do quite that long, or I have to pay too much to be able to access that. But while now we have some technologies, I'm not listing all of them, that enable us to work in a different way. One, we have internet. Right? So it allows us instant communication along long distances. Right? So we don't have to send people on horses to like, the other part of the world to be able to do things. Right? <coughs> Sorry. We have blockchain. Uh, whatever you think about blockchain, some people have an allergy to this word. NFT is Web3. Um, name it whatever you want. If you don't like the word blockchain, use the word very complex, very good uh, databases that anybody can access. So we have blockchain and Web3 that allows us transparency. We can show everything to anyone. Uh, it allows us new modes of governance and very quick decision making. It allows us trust into people you don't know. Right? You couldn't do that 400 years ago. You meet a brand new person, you're like, who the hell are you? You must be an enemy. That's your thought number one, because otherwise you'll be dead. Like with blockchain, you can have some trust in people you don't know. Uh, I'm not going to explain how. Artificial intelligence simplifies a lot of cognitive work and makes a lot of things available. Robotics allows us to do hard stuff that we don't have to outsource to slaves anymore. Right? VR, AR allows us to have remote work uh, anywhere in any field. One of my really good friends, he has a very interesting career path. During the day, he works as a robotics driver. In Estonia, we have this company that like, has these robots that deliver stuff. So sometimes they get stuck, and they get a real person with a joystick in an office who drives them across the street, right? He, like, logins, and that's his job. He's a robot driver. But at night, he is an uh, architect in the metaverse. So he's an architect in the metaverse, and he is a robot driver, right? These things were not possible before. So it, this gives us a lot of technological possibilities to create companies and organizations that are just different, where people don't have to hate what they do. <coughs> but there's a problem of you. It's a real problem, right? Because a lot of speakers said today, well, Companies are going to change stuff, things are going to change. Nothing is going to change unless you guys change. We can't wait for some organization like Facebook or someone else to be like, you know what? Here, take everything. Right? It's going to be fully transparent now. Every, you know what? I'm Apple. I make so much money. 
I'm not gonna give it to my shareholders, I'm gonna give it to the people who actually create the products. This year, everybody gets 700,000 euro more. That's about the real number if Apple were to give away all their money to actually the people that made the work. So, but you have to change. You have to start playing and having fun. You need to start loving your job and doing what you do, right? You need to do things that are crazy. Like, I'm a speaker right now, so some things are expected of me, like there's a stage, right? And I have to do things in a certain way. I have already broken some rules about being a speaker today. I was silent for like 25 seconds. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to like sit down, right? And, and, and do this as a speaker, right? So you have to break some rules and you have to do things. You have to talk to people. What's your name? Alexandra. Alexandra here. What's your dream? What do you want to achieve in life? Peace. Peace. For who? For you or for the world? For the world. For the world. Excellent. What are you going to do about it? I don't know yet. You don't know yet. So that's a good place to start, right? To figure out, like, you know, you want peace in the world. A lot of us want to be an actor, an actress, have peace, do stuff. And in entrepreneurship, what I find interesting, <clears throat> I'm an investor as well. And sometimes when I invest or try to invest, I ask founders this simple question. Like if you have $100 million in your bank account, right, and you want me to invest into you now, like imagine we, I invest into you now, we have a great exit, you get $100 million in the bank account, what are you going to do? Like 99% of the time, it will be anything but the same startup, like anything else. And I'm like, why don't you just do that? Right, like, you know, do it now. They, they, they run a fintech blockchain AI company in the metaverse, but they say once they have $100 million, they want to help people with financial troubles in Africa. Fine, like go do a startup in that field. Like what's stopping you? I have an investment portfolio of about, not that many, like 10, 15 companies. The best performing one is a musical company called Neural DSP. That guy, no matter what you do, he'll always be doing musical startups, 100% of the time, right? No matter like, he just like lives and breathes music and engineering. And there's like almost no people like that. So I think we need to like redefine what it means for you to be you, for you to know what you do, to have fun. Can I ask everybody to get up for a second? Everybody, everybody, get up. I'll get up as well. All right, good. All right, and then jump. Yeah, okay, good. You can sit down. I did it just so that I can have fun, right? To feel the power <laughs> that I can get like what, 100 people that are remaining and not too hungry to get up and sit down and do two jumps. You know how cool that is? To get like people to get up just because you want them to? And the only way to do that is by traveling to Georgia and doing a speech and then asking people to get up. Right? You have to have fun with life, have to have fun with work. And I think it's the same approach at work. Like, I would hate my job if I would like, do everything the way people think I should be doing. I would be bored to death. I don't know how people do it. And I think the way to change that and to start doing that is first, well, you know, have fun, play the game. Right? But I think the way I discovered it is when I realized that I have to take responsibility for everything. And that doesn't mean blame and guilt, two different things. It means responsibility. I can respond to any situation that comes to me, and whatever I create in life, I'm responsible for it. It makes me a better CEO, a better, I, I, don't, I don't even have a title anymore, but when I was a CEO. But it makes me able to realize that I have control. And all those institutions, they want you to not take responsibility, actually. They tell you that they want you to take responsibility. But if you actually do, that means you'll be like poking holes in the system. Founders, CEOs, they always go like, I want my employees to take responsibility. And then the moment they do, the employees go like, you have this broken, I want to fix this, I want to change this. They go like, no, 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 why are they taking so much responsibility? They want to change everything. So like, you need to start taking a lot of responsibility for your lives. And I take it to like extreme levels. You really need to think about, my dad is a sea captain, and I think he kind of instilled it in me, that the sea captain is always at fault. And I think it's beautiful because if you take that responsibility, you always go like, I can always change things. And you stop blaming people. For example, as a CEO, very often you get a situation where an employee is performing bad, makes mistakes. 
Most CEOs fire that person, and two weeks later, they hire exactly the same person. Right, and they repeat exactly the same mistake. So they don't go like, well, what, what, what did I do wrong? How come I hired a person who's you know, not capable? Is my training wrong? Is my onboarding wrong? Am I teaching people wrongly about my company? Do I not have a proper culture set up? Do I not talk to them about my values? Like, what am I doing wrong to make sure this doesn't happen to me? So you have to take this responsibility. But to do that, you have to take action and you need to know yourself and to play the game. So imagine a different world. Imagine a company, or rather, let's make it real, let's imagine a cafe. Imagine a cafe of the future, right? Where there's no owners, there's no managers, <clears throat> there's no CEOs, there's no equity. In fact, there's no salary. And you go there and you have some coffee. You order a cup, okay, I don't drink coffee, tea. You order tea. Very good Chinese tea. I'm a fan of tea. I do tea ceremonies. If you come to Estonia, let me know. We'll do some tea ceremonies together. So, tea. You go and buy some tea. And in this, in this imaginary cafe, you have like uh, graphs on the side. And it says, we have really bad copywriting on the website. And we need help tomorrow to open at 9 a.m. And like you have your tea and like, huh, I'm pretty good at copywriting. So you drink your tea, you, go, you, you do some copywriting for them, you submit it, you get some points, and then three months later you're sitting at home and you get a bill for 100 euros because your copywriting was selected, it got through, uh, you don't know how, you don't know why, and your points became real money. So this is the world that I think we're going towards, where there will not be uh, de facto companies and organizations with owners and CEOs and people like that. But it will take time and it will take people like you to start acting that way. Because I think in the future we can act, all, track all transactions, right? We can see everything that's happening. That gives a lot of trust, right? We can put all your work into NFTs, I know everybody hates this word, into a record that is hard to counterfeit. And you will basically, instead of putting pictures and funny stuff into that thing, it will be the history of all the things you've done. And it, wouldn't it be cool, you know, in, in the Apollo program, if we could actually track the name of every person and what they did and how they contributed to everything. That would be very cool. So you will be able to do that. And ownership will be based on what you contribute to the system and not how much you know, points you scribbled on a piece of paper in a cafe when you co-founded the company. And I think we're heading towards that, towards automation. And with the roles are gonna change, right? You're not gonna be just like one thing anymore. I hate when, you know, when people ask, like, who are you? Introduce yourself, and you have to be like, my title is this, blah, blah, blah. Like, it doesn't define me. And I think the roles are gonna change. Employees are gonna be employers. Investors are gonna be clients. Owners are gonna be everything. It's, it's all gonna be one thing. You can do all of that as one individual. And I think it's gonna be exciting, a lot of fun, and we need to get there. Bus drivers. Jobs that are you know, historically considered, you know, they always put them as an example of a boring job. Well, it doesn't have to be. Now you might have the same way as an Uber app. You might wake up in the morning and be like, hey, you want to be a bus driver for a day? Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah, I never tried that. I have the license. I can do it. And it says, well, go from A to B and C and you know, press this button to open doors and say hi to everybody. You do it for a day. And you're like, ah, fun. I can be a bus driver. You would hate to do it every day, but if you do it, two times a year, listen to an audiobook, learn something, drive a bus, pretty cool. I want to be a drive bus for a day, not for a year though. So I think a lot of this is going to change and we're not going to have organizations anymore, we're going to have organisms. But what I think is really cool here is that this is not some you know, imaginary future that's never going to happen. We've had companies like this for more than 100 years. If you guys look up Teal Organizations, or The Great Game of Business as a book, uh, Reinventing Organizations is also a book. It talks about companies that have had flat structures, open book accounting, decision making, where anybody can make any decision in the company at all. Right? We've had that for a, you know, almost 100 years, maybe more, if you dig deeper. So companies like Patagonia, Bootsork, our company, Earthians, we don't have salaries, we don't have titles. Uh, we don't have equity, nothing. None, none of that matters. We want to do cool stuff. And then we figure out when money comes in, we're like, well, you know, let's, let's split it fairly. 
We have specific th systems built for that, but, and that's where we're heading. So the cool thing is that this already exists. You can go and work for a company that's completely flat tomorrow. Okay, maybe not tomorrow. I mean, give it a week. So what I'm suggesting is that you can own your time. You can move to a life where you own your life and you own yourself. But you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> and this is just a 20, 25-minute talk, so I can't change your lives in, you know, like this. Only you can do it. But I'm going to make some suggestions. For you not to be a cog in the system, I'm going to make three practical suggestions. Take responsibility for three things. Take responsibility for your time. For example, maybe you don't like to wake up in the morning the way your company thinks you should wake up in the morning. Tell them, look, you know what? No meetings before 12. I do that, right? Anybody who works with me, they know that no meetings before 12. Sorry, guys. You know, it's in your best interest. Because if you force me to have a meeting before 12, I'm going to be tired the whole day, and I'm not going to work as well. It's not good for you guys to force me to have a meeting early on. You know, maybe you don't like a specific thing you know, or specific meeting you have. Move it by half an hour. Right? Or tell people that the meeting is useless and nobody really needs it at all. Speak up for things you don't like. Two, take some responsibility for productivity. Right? Try to figure out uh, what makes you productive. Sleep, food, exercise. Do some experiments with that. And finally, take responsibility for yourself. Get to know who you are. I recommend understandmyself.com. Jordan Peterson's Understand Myself um, uh, Psychometric Testing. I think it's very good. I also would like to invite you to take one action in your company, organization, university, school. I don't know what you do. Take one action to change something that annoys you in that organization. Whatever it is, it can be small. There's no toilet paper or I don't care. Like something. Something that annoys you, change it. You know, tell somebody, be like, I don't like this. Don't like this, let's change it, it's stupid. Right, one thing, can be tiny, right? Uh, and finally, I invite you to have more fun, right? I invite you to play, get people to get up, get people to, you know, bring something fun to the office, play a board game, do a tea ceremony, do something that makes you enjoy your work. Have fun. You know, I was once, uh, about half a, half a year ago in the US, and there was uh, this TSA agent at the security board, Thing and with every person coming through, he was like telling them a joke, asking them where they are. He was having a blast. He was having so much fun being a TSA agent. It's all about the mindset. He was just having fun. He was, you know, when he was opening things, he was like asking about things. It's just, I just, I never laughed so much at the security check, right? Because the person just had a different mindset. So I invite you to play. And I think to conclude. If we start doing these things and we start really understanding who we are, why we do things, we will also learn more about, well, what's good for us and what's good for the planet. You will soon discover, probably, that you don't need as much stuff, that you don't need as many things, you don't need to work for companies that are bad, you don't need to be immoral, you don't need to do all these things, because you will be true to yourself, and you will stop doing things that are really bad for us, our planet, and for what we do. So I really invite you to start your change at home, at work, and to take real action. With that, if you liked what you heard, I invite you to join uh, Earthians uh, in the Discord channel. And if you do, I'll also send you some materials, books. I mentioned some things that maybe you would like. Just let me know that you joined, and I will send you some materials. <clears throat> but in the, in the all, and also, if you want to have a chat, you can just have a call with me. Right? I love talking to people. Uh, about anything, you know, personal life, how to quit your job, uh, you know, your marriage is not going well, uh, you don't know what to do with your kids, anything, you know, doesn't matter, right? I'd love to have to talk, to talk to people. So, with that, I really hope that after this talk, you guys will start playing a little bit more. Thank you.